Thank you. Good morning to everyone. Hope you had a good weekend. I am before you today to make a very important announcement. And that announcement concerns the micro and small MSME loan grant facility. As you know, the deadline for this was actually tomorrow, the 30th. And we want to tell you that we've taken a decision to extend the deadline for applications for the MSME loan program to Friday, the 31st of May. So I really want to take this moment because we have quite a few persons that are still requesting time to um, get the registration of the companies together, their business names. Quite a few persons are having a challenge to complete the, the project plans. So we've taken a decision to extend the deadline to the 31st of May. So that is an additional month. And I want to tell all and sundry to please contact the ministry. Um, we have had for the past month quite a few online sessions to encourage persons and to help them prepare their business plans and to tell them the requirements for the application for the MSME loan program. So we are hoping that all those persons who are interested with this extension of time, that they will work with the ministry to ensure, and the other consultants who are working with them, to ensure that they have their proposals ready to meet this extended deadline. So, um, by the minister. Um, Yes, good. Yeah, Madam Minister, um, so what um, generally or basically would you say has been the, the type of um, produ products or commodities or services, you know, across the board that, that, that people come up with? You mean persons who have applied? Yes. Oh, well. all walks of life. Um, and as you know, we've taken a decision very early to, um, based on age in particular, to separate the applicants uh, the young persons up to age 35 should, we direct them all the time to the youth economy. And we are dealing with persons 31 to 60 for the MSME loan program. But it varies. We are surprised that we had quite a huge number from agriculture. A huge number from agriculture. Um, the tourism sector also came up very high. A lot of restaurant owners, persons wanting to open bars and places like this. One area that we felt was underserved at the time was ITC. And we really felt that um, we were a little surprised that we were not getting more businesses in that area. So we are now doing some targeted um, work with some of the sectors. For example, another area that um, we've not received much application from is the fashion, fashion sector. So we are working with that sector as a cluster. Because in some areas, the, 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 the departments and, and sectors require special assistance. So we are also doing that. Yeah, you said you're doing targeted work. So is there like any incentives that go into that specific sector, anything like that? No, no additional incentives. It's just, for example, if we're going to look at fashion, um, you need persons who understand that industry. You need persons who understand um, all sectors of that industry. So what we need is to, we've worked with the Fashion Council, we've met with them, and we said like, this is your specialized area, so you need to sit down and see what are the special equipments that we need if we have to move the fashion industry. And then we say, we will be working with you and your members. So that's that. The same thing for, for, for farmers, for example, um, farmers that are members of cooperatives. So we need to sit and say, well, what sector are you on? You might um, have heard, a little separate from this, that, for example, in Sufra, I decided to work with Dashin farmers, because I know Fochajak has the right climatic conditions for that. But you might have young persons that want to go into farming, and you might have this different technology that is required. So we need to work with them separately. So vegetable farmers, different, so we that's important for us. And with the, with the persons in the um, arts, you know, we've had this big um, 
exposition in the in the boulevard, you know, on the Chosel farmers, the, the Rousseau. Mm -hmm. Would these people do they get, get an interest? Do they have a, an opportunity to, to build up the well, products? Well, you, you you meet them and they say they are interested. So you didn't have to say you have to come to the office. Then we have to link them with the extension officers or a technical person from the Ministry of Agriculture to cause it to happen. So sometimes it requires a lot more hand-holding than we expect, but that is where we are. And what, what would be the, the amount of applicants you have to date? Or how many? What is well, the I have figures? not focused. We have not focused. We have a lot of in, um, unfinished applicants. People are coming in and out, but the sessions that we've had, we have more than 100, 200 persons attending the online sessions. So now is to hold the hands of those various persons, put them in groups and categories, and try to get them to the finishing line. Um, do you have any information on the amount of people that have been turned away, like are not able to fit the type of criteria? Um, the, from the first calling, we had about just about 118 persons that, um, whose applica applications were declined. And even then, we, have, we took a decision that these persons should come to the office so that we can, they can understand what um, the reason for the decline and that they could still apply within the second calling with guidance from the ministry. Okay. Yeah, that is critical. That's an important thing because those persons were declining the first calling. You still have an opportunity to get to the office to understand why your application was declined, and then to get support, technical support, to reapply. And will these, those people that reapply, they, they were able to reapply like within the same time, or they had to go again with another time for open call? Or no, 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 they had to reapply right for this second calling. Okay. Okay. And that's the second calling that is now extended to the end of May. Yeah. Okay, so any other questions concerning MSME? Most of you young people, have you applied to the MSME loan program? No, not yet. Yeah? You need... Money, you need money applied, money. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's an important issue for you all because so all of you have applied, individual right? skills. Mm -hmm. Skills. What is the basic criteria? What's the basic... Um, criteria like requirement to start like a startup what is it that you need the plans and everything but what well, yeah, collateral you, you and what look at what business you want to create for example most of you here would go into services um whether you you whatever part of that sector that you are in and then you determine what sector you're going into you have to determine what type of equipment you would be needing you have to put a, a structure together in terms of a plan, which market segment that you're going to penetrate, things like that. And then you need to put that together. And you have to get a name for your business. Um, you can come to the ministry. They will get help you do that registration. Um, get a business name, register the, the business, whether as a company or as a business, uh, with just a trade name and agree on the services that you're going to provide. Then your application would include things like equipment, um, if you need technical assistance, if you may have to engage a consultant for a short, short while, um, your marketing, things like that. That's what it is. And the ministry provides all this additional support? support? Yes. yes. And what about the, um, would there be a cap, say like a 30,000? Is no, there a payment to, plan that you, you have to go for? for us, a very new business at the first time, if you're actually doing this at the very, very first time, it's up to $10,000. With 7,000 being a grant and 3,000 being a loan at 3%. If you're already in business for up to two years, you, up to, you, you qualify up to $20,000. Again, 70% of that being $14,000 being a grant and the six being a loan. And persons who have been in business for a long time, the max is 25000 You need to apply. You need to apply. <laughs> They'll do that. So your new deadline is end of May. Okay, so please share that word for us because there it is. Your government really, really working with you so that you can be the next millionaire tomorrow. I'm looking forward to seeing the growth 
of the business community. Our second speaker is Honorable Dr. Virginia Poyot, Minister for the Public Service, Home Affairs, Labor, and Gender Relations. Okay, um, I would like to remind the general public that on Wednesday, this week, that is May Day, that is May 1st, and we also term it Labor Day. And every year, internationally, about 100 countries observe um, Labor Day. And Labor Day basically is to recognize the contributions of workers so that in St. Lucia, we have it as an official holiday for workers to reflect, to relax, and to take a break from work. And for this year, we will have an open session in public. And that will be at the Serenity Park, starting from 10 AM. Um, there will be praise and worship and addresses by different persons, um, including the Prime Minister. Honorable Prime Minister will be addressing the gathering. I will be addressing the gathering as Minister of Labor. We have representatives of the Employers Federation and the representatives of all the trade unions in St. Lucia. So we are basically encouraging as many persons as possible to come out and celebrate that day as Workers' Day, Labor Day, or May Day. Um, in, after the speeches and the, the, the remarks by different um, persons on the platform, we will culminate with um, a cultural presentation with different um, Calypsonian singing songs that are relevant to the struggles of working people in St. Lucia. Now, at this time, I know the big issue is around minimum wage, and the Department of Labor has delivered up to a point where we appointed a minimum wage commission, which has completed the, the, the report and submitted to the Cabinet of Ministers. And since then, the Prime Minister has made a pronouncement that on August 1st, he will announce the minimum wage for St. Lucia. So the Department of Labor is busy putting things together and working with the, the minimum wage commission so that we can get this um, message out there and give the St. Lucian public, the media, the employers, the trade unions and workers to have a say in, in con contributing to the discussion around what they think a minimum wage is, why they think it is this and why it's not that, so that at least people will send any objection, any suggestions that they have which we can respond to before the official announcement is made. Okay, so recently you said that you would be having, they would be having a minimum wage across the board as it would be difficult to have one for each sector. Can you tell me um, what challenges arose that um, contributed to that decision? No, minimum wage is not um, something that you put for everybody in terms of what will you get as your minimum wage as a carpenter or a plumber or a teacher or a policeman. Minimum wage is what government would consider to be the smallest amount of money that somebody is supposed to earn on a monthly basis. And they work it out on an hourly basis. When they give out the figure, they say if you work for eight hours a day, for um, let's say 20 days, which is four weeks of the month, you should take home X amount of money. And that is what will help you cope with what you really need in terms of your basic needs. So and nobody in St. Lucia should earn below that after they have worked for a full month. Now, if you are a carpenter, you are a mason, you are an electrician, these different um, sectors have the salary that you pay for these. So it means that these people are way above minimum wage, so that does not apply to them. 
Okay. okay. And um, when was the report from the commission submitted to cabinet? Um, well, it was presented in two parts. Um, I think sometime in February they did their first presentation and they came back again um, in March to do the second presentation because um, they asked them to go and get some additional data to, to refine the presentation, so they came back to give the final presentation. And it was after that final presentation the Prime Minister decided to make a, a pronouncement because by then there was a, a good understanding of the way forward. Um, now, as you know, we have been talking about uh, minimum wage as well as livable wage. So the Prime Minister will explain the difference between the minimum and the livable so that um, the St. Lucian public and even the, the commission, they will be responding to questions that persons have. So it's an ongoing dialogue until an announcement is made. So it's not a cast in stone. There is no decision and uh, as if we are saying that's what it is. We have to consult the public so that they too have a say in what the minimum wage um, should be like. Mm -hmm. Yeah, when developing the minimum wage, I don't know if you'll be able to answer that, but what type of like criteria was what you guys using? Like what type of standard? Well, they used the ILO standards and they had a special formula you use to work out what a minimum wage is. For example, when we look at minimum wage, there are a number of factors you have to take into consideration with, with regards to cost of living and everything in the country. Then we compare with what's happening in the Caribbean, and we also compare with what ILO convention and, and regulation will see that um, according to their standards, nobody's supposed to earn X amount per hour for them to have a, a, a minimum wage and close to a livable wage. Yes, well, um, there are some sectors we know that not fully um, represented by trade unions. Mm -hmm. Take, for instance, we have the the construction workers. I would say the construction workers, the, some of the um, retail the retail sector workers, uh, um, security officers. Mm -hmm. Would this would this cover everybody generally? Uh, workers generally would would be covered. Um, you this? talk of the minimum wage. Yes. Well, as I said, the minimum wage is an hourly rate that you should not work below that um, for, for any job that you do. You will earn a lot more depending on the type of job that you do. Um, the issue of unionization of workers is one that um, the trade unions need to be a little more aggressive in educating persons and workers. Why is it important to be unionized? And as you know, for you to be a bargaining body for any group of persons in any one sector, you must have at least 50% plus one for you to be the legitimate um, union bargaining. Now, there are persons who are members of a union, but that union may not be the bargaining agent because they have not been recognized by the employer, meaning that they do not have 50% plus one person representing them as a union. So if 10 persons, let's say from Wasco, decide to join the National Workers Union or the CSE, these persons, the union can guide them, but the union cannot go to Wasco and say, I am their representative, because Wasco must first recognize you as the bargaining agent for these people. And for you to be the bargaining agent, they have to take a poll, a vote in the institution, and you must get 50% plus one of the members who are registered with your union to be the bargaining agent. Um, this goes back to the Labor Day, um, the Labor Day like celebration, and I know y'all had a press conference where y'all mentioned ge increasing like gender representation and equality in different working like different sectors. Um, in regards to that, I know y'all spoke about gender equality and allowing women to to take part in certain types of jobs where usually it would not it would not be seen as a woman's a woman's type job, right? Mm -hmm. So I wanted to know what like what how would this be done? Like are you guys looking to reach out to employers or is it just giving these types of people these skills or what what exactly would be done to to facilitate this initiative? Okay, um there is a a, a business um from Canada 
who approached us through the gender department here in St. Lucia. And we have been working with him from last year. And what they want to do is to help women get into the construction sector. Yeah. And that's an area where through um, gender discrimination, um, women are told that they cannot work in the construction sector. It's heavy duty. And because of the physical buildup, they, sh they cannot afford to go and work like bricklayers and doing construction. So I think when we look at what's happening in some other countries, women are in all sectors. And if you look at Ministry of Infrastructure, you see so many women who are engineers. So now with um, mechanization, modernization, there are a lot of things that can be used using um, equipment to do it. You don't have to physically lift up how many bags of cement and lift up how many blocks. The, 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 you use the equipment that will lift it up and so on. And then women can be supervisors on the construction site and other things that they can. So we felt that we need to open the door to allow women who want to go into construction to participate. So what they have to do now is to begin to train. So we are going to train them. And they also wanted St. Lucia to be the hub. That means persons, women from the other islands, the OECS, they could come to St. Lucia, do their training, and then they go back to the country to, to participate in the construction industry. Um, I, I am of the view that there are too many women who have settled for the softer jobs and the low-paying jobs, because most women settle for um, housekeeping, caregiver, they are involved in the step and cutting grass and those things, and they do not see construction as an area because they have not been trained to, to work in that area. I think we need to encourage women to explore um, their skills and see how they can get employed. As the Prime Minister indicated, in the coming months there will be a lot of construction work that will be going on in St. Lucia. And we may very well end up having a shortage of labor or skilled labor in a number of areas. And it means we might have to import persons from outside of St. Lucia to come and work here. Do we have, can women go into that area so that they actually cater for the shortage of, of, of manpower and persons to work in these areas? It's something that we may not even be prepared for now because we have to start training them now. Mm -hmm. And also, you mentioned the discrimination. So, in I understand that you guys will be training women to have this type of skill set, but the discrimination ultimately comes down to the the employer because people people can have the same amount of skills, and it's that is the deploy, employer's discretion. So, will there be anything there in that regard to encourage women working in that type of sector, or is it, or have you not taken that into account? Well, whatever? as we are moving into the gender equality, gender sensitization. It is one where we have to raise the awareness of employers and the traditional thing that they think, okay, this type of jobs is only men that can do it. But when they do bring women in, they will see sometimes they might even get greater, greater returns. So there is no harm in exploring new areas to create employment and to open the gap and for us to work towards achieving greater gender equality in the society. Mm -hmm. yeah. I have a question. Just to ensure that I'm getting you um, clearly, when you stated that um, you want to encourage unions, in terms of the minimum wages, is it only enforceable for unionized workers or let's say somebody from the security or just a private company um, is not getting that minimum wage, whatever it's set at, can they now go to the Labor Department and file a complaint? Is it going to be enforceable for them as well? Yes, the minimum wage has nothing to do with the trade union. It's for all employees, no matter where you work. And the Labor Department now will have to be the one to monitor. And persons who felt they were disadvantaged or the employer took advantage of them, they will report the matter to the Labor Department first to address. And government's laws will see that it is unacceptable for any employer to pay any worker below X amount. So it is not just for unionized workers. But if you have a union, the union will be more aggressive in representing you.
Yes. And also, um, during his appropriation bill um, discussion, um, debate, sorry, Dr. Anthony would have mentioned the additional strain or impending strain that would now fall upon the Labor Department, including the commissioner, um, with complaints that may arise from the implementation. Um, do you see that to be true? And if yes, um, what provisions would be made to ensure that the department itself is able to handle this? Well, I had discussion with the Labor Commissioner, even on the matter raised by um, um, Dr. Anthony. But as you know, the, the Labor Act is down for revision. There are a number of areas that are already obsolete. They are no longer relevant. And the issue about the additional work and burden for the Labor Commissioner is one that we will be paying attention to. So there are quite a few changes that are being recommended, but we want the unions, we want the employers and government to have a say in the different clause that we will make um, changes to in the Labour Act. So we we are going to make some changes in that direction. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in the same vein of compensation and minimum wage, I know that HR Wise is currently doing a compensation survey to consolidate, like to have so they could be a general guide of of the pay rates for different types of jobs. Do you have any thoughts on this? Any? Um, well, uh, you see, at one time we thought the the minimum wage commission would be in a position to give us a minimum wage for different sectors. Now, given the time frame that we had for us to get what we call the basic minimum wage, it did not allow the time for us to go into the different sectors. It's going to be a very tedious exercise, but there is no harm in pursuing that so that, that people know um, for farmers what a minimum wage should be. If you're a hotel worker, what your minimum wage should be. If you're an electrician, so at least we provide a guide um, where employees are not disadvantaged or employers take advantage of some of the people because they may not know what is the minimum level that they should work for. Um, if you want a, a mason, one person will tell you, oh, it's 120 a day. Some might tell you I'm not working for less than $200 a day. Now, sometimes these persons are not certified. They, they tell you they are mason, they are bricklayer, and you haven't seen any record of their work. So when you do that, you are taking a chance. So that is why we are bringing in the CVQ to show that you are certified in that area. Because some people learned on the job, and they became mason, they became carpenters, they became plumbers, but nobody has anything to certify that they are really somebody of that level and should get X amount of pay. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Madam Minister. From we are expecting the announcement on August first, is first, it? Yeah, Emancipation Day. <laughs> on Emancipation Day, free yeah. the people. Um, that's that's going to be great for everyone. Uh, the implementation timeline. Can you give us an indication as to when that would be? Well, is it one year from the announcement, six months? Or? No, I'll, I will defer that to the Prime Minister to give the, the effective date. But I would um, expect him to make that announcement on a significant date, which is Emancipation Day. And then he will give the details on the effective dates. And from, from the time you give the effective date, because you have to give the employers some time to put things in place, and interestingly, the minimum wage, based on our assessment, will cost employers some extra money. And therefore, you have to give them time to organize. So all that discussion will come out in the coming months. So government will know whether it will be fully operational within six months or three months and so on. So that at least they begin to make the adjustment. And then the Labor Department can begin to start being vigilant to see if employers are implementing. And the workers will be under guard too because they'll know if they are underpaid and they can report the matter. So on the question of the Labor Department to assist in that implementation, the Labor Commissioner himself has said that eight Labor officers was woefully uh, inadequate for the department to be able to deal with the expected influx mm -hmm. of whether it be inquiries, uh, complaints, arising from the minimum wage implementation. 
what is the government's plan to assist the Labor Department or equipping it with the necessary manpower okay. to police? Mm -hmm. Okay, now, um, once we have introduced a new concept, which, especially when you need to get it going, you need to put additional resources there, both human and material resources to make it function and make it effective. Or as people will say, they just announced a minimum wage and they didn't see any difference. So that would require greater monitoring. And it is one that I discussed with the Labor, um, the Minimum Wage Commission, that their work will not end as soon as they announce the minimum wage. They are supposed to assist government in the implementation because they better understand. And we may not just leave that for labor officers at the Department of Labor. We may have to have a special unit that will monitor um, the minimum wage maybe up to the first year or so to ensure that people get to understand and then it is effective. Just two other questions, Madam Minister. On still on the minimum wage, the legislation that needs to come into effect uh, to accompany that, since the announcement is coming for 1st August, when can we expect the legislation to uh, come to the House? And uh, I'll allow you to answer, and I'll ask the second question, my final question. Okay. The, the legislation definitely will come before the announcement. And what we are doing now um, with the Minimum Wage Commission is to engage the public and all the other stakeholders so that we give them an opportunity to have a say where we can make adjustment to any suggestions that they have made before we move forward. But the legislation will be amended and enacted before the announcement is made, so it becomes law. Mm -hmm. And my final question has to do with the construction sector and the introduction or the um, heightened participation or employment of women in that sector. Have we done any studies here on island to determine that our women are truly indeed interested in, in being part of the construction sector? Because in other countries, um, and far more advanced countries than, than us, several studies have shown that um, no matter what, women are going to gravitate towards what they really want to do. And even in the STEM uh, field, um, we are always pushing for women to go there, but women seem to innately have particular interest, no matter how much we expose them to other avenues. Innately, we seem to want particular things. So what is the data that we are um, being guided by as we seek to invest money into allowing women more participation in the construction sector? Okay, now, um, what you call a cultural shift is not something that is easy because based on stereotype, our women and our boys have been socialized in a particular way. And therefore, we have to begin to change that socialization process. And it has to start in the home, it has to start in the schools. And you would have heard that the Minister of Education said they are actually establishing four TVET schools and one of them will deal with construction and other areas. So you may very well start seeing young girls going into that area before they graduate from school, where they can be in the construction industry. The, the, I think what would entice women to move into the construction industry is to let them see that construction is not as heavy lifting as some people make it sound like, and therefore it would be a strain on them as women. So we start shifting the stereotype. And then we show them the money. Because unless they see what the people in the construction industry is earning compared to them who will spend the same eight hours at work. And they said, if you are in the construction industry, at the end of the month, your salary would be this. But you are staying and you say you want to be caregivers, you want to be babysitting, that's what you feel comfortable, this is what your salary will be. Which one would you prefer? Which one would you want to? You give them that choice. And some people may want to go into the heavier pay industry and develop the skills to be there. Because we cannot see a situation where we have women who could have participated in the construction industry. And now we have to bring persons from overseas to do the work that maybe they could have done. 
Okay? So unless, but I cannot tell you it will happen overnight because it's a cultural shift. But at least we can start. Are we doing any studies, so uh, any investigation on the ground, uh, even at the school level? Are we collecting data to guide us on this? Right. So the Ministry of Education would have its data for the TVET program because they are getting ready for that. Right now, the, the the gender department is the one working with that other company that has expressed interest, and I think he wanted to start even sometime last year. So it's a matter of starting small because remember, people want to trade carefully, and then you move to the larger thing. So it's not something where we say tomorrow we'll have 500 or 600 or 1,000 women coming into, but gradually people begin to see that there is a shift. And it will take some time before they make that, that, that kind of shape. But I am confident that if we market it, and as I tell you, you show them the money, they will move. Just one other thing. Sorry, Mr. Mm -hmm. just, just clarify for us, the company, uh, what particularly is its interest? What, what does it do with services and so forth? Um, well, it's a, a gentleman. I think he's a St. Lucian based in Canada. And he was working with some other agency. So he came and he had a meeting with the director of gender and myself as minister to sell the proposal. So we felt it was a good concept, it was a good idea, and therefore we said, let us go ahead and see whether this is possible. So that is why I'm saying that there is a window opening. Sometimes our local people may decide to go into that area, not just somebody from Canada. You have a lot of construction companies who want to start training women to do bricklaying and doing how you mix your mortar and whatever, whatever. So some people can go there and they can give them, they can give them a project as one of the um, practical to see how are you going to do that wall and whatever, whatever. And then give them a little certificate so that they can move on. So the individual is opening up a sort of a learning center, a school, a TVET center? You mean? Yes, that's in what. We, in fact, we were looking at Monrepo as the location. They had identified a building there to start the, the training. So just once again, to be clear, mm. that particular St. Lucian uh, Canadian will be the one spearheading that. Yes, yes, yeah. But in collaboration with the gender department. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I now present Senior Minister, Honorable Stevenson King, Minister for Infrastructure, Ports, Transport, Physical Development, and Urban Renewal. <coughs> thank you very much, Press Secretary, and thank you to you, the members of the media. I welcome the opportunity to address you on whatever subject matters that you may have, whatever questions, issues, or matters of concern pertaining to infrastructure and all the other portfolios which I presently manage. Hot 7 TV. Uh, Minister, are you pleased with the um, progress at the cul de sac roundabout for now? I'm pleased with the progress. Mm -hmm. As I indicated sometime recently, the government has not been pleased with the rate of implementation. On the, on the Millennium Highway, including the roundabout. However, in recent times, we have seen some improvements in the, in the delivery of work. We have seen the shaping of the road coming on nicely, and I'm hoping that the contractor will be able to pull it through and to attain the deadline date, which they did themselves, the finish date, if I should use that term, which they have set for June. So to this date, I'm thinking that we have seen some effort on the part of the contractor and we have seen some improvements. Sorry. Um, in regards to the, the road works that's happening for the, I think, Kaimeche to Boiseju, the road mm -hmm. for, for cricket, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's not the road for cricket. It's part of the network of roads being done as part of the year of infrastructure. Yeah. However, cricket is more or less around the corner, so that one mm -hmm. is quite strategic for us. Okay, well, no problem, <coughs> no problem. I know that, that as someone that lives in the area, they've been doing expansion. I know that they moved some um, speed, well, not all the speed bumps, they removed them, whatnot. And 
some people in the area have been having a little bit of like criticism about the initiative because they're saying like this has been known to be a residential area and ex the expansion of roads and the removal of speed bumps it does present some kind of a challenge moving forward for vehicles that will be passing there are lots of children in the area whatnot so you have any comment in regards to that anytime there's reconstruction of roads all road furniture is removed and then replaced later on so speed bumps would have been moved if there were guardrails on the side of the road where the road is being expanded, the guardrails would have been moved. To facilitate the actual construction, the reconstruction of the road, the speed bumps would be removed and mm -hmm. replaced after construction. Okay, so you'll be saying that the speed, all the speed bumps are there will be repurposed yes, and put... Yes. Okay, no problem. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yes, um, Mr. Minister, yeah, you, I think our last, um, the last briefing you mentioned the... the the extension of the, you know, the, the um, secondary roads and also the bus stops. Mm -hmm. I think just lately we saw a, a development in um, Sarot. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, seeing the 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 the, um, the busyness of the northern route, do you do you foresee anytime soon? You know, such a project being implemented for the northern route. You know, Grosile Moshi. You know, this in terms area. of the concept. Yeah. The, the bus stop. The bus stop. Where there is a bus stop now. There is. There's um, facilities, there's mm -hmm. washroom, you know, and it's, it's mm -hmm. more feasible mm -hmm. for, especially Rodney Bay, you know, it's raining. These areas are very watery, you know. It's Certainly, I cannot give you can a start date when we can begin to do this sort of thing along the Castries Grosley Highway. Because the Castries Grosley Highway is on the, on the, on the well, I should say, on the, on, on the plan for reconstruction from the Shock Bridge all the way to Grosley. So in terms of putting in that kind of furniture along the roadway, uh, we would have to wait after the, after the construction of the roadway, the final design, and then that would be factored in and then to be constructed during the process of reconstruction of the road. But it is something that we've been speaking about for some time now, and that is to begin to make those bus stops a, 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 sort, of, a sort of center of activity so that it is not a lonely place, but it's supposed to be a very comfortable place to pull up with certain facilities being provided, not just to sit and wait for the bus, but being able to get what I call a 7-Eleven service of some basic items that one may want to get. At the same time, not creating it at a, as a major commercial hub. Just one quick follow-up. We talk of bus stops. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the, especially the Grosley area, mm -hmm. there has not been any attempt yet to make putting a bus stop in the Grosily town. You know, you have the Friday night street party where the bus drivers mm -hmm. cannot even get a place to park. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's just a regular if the police don't yeah. intervene, yeah. what what would be, you know, the the, the feasible, you know, um, attempt for somewhere like <coughs> Grosily to put in such kind of infrastructure because it's a busy time. It is a time, concern. It is a concern for us. We have been speaking about of, of what I call setting up some terminus in certain locations. So, example, at the Shock Roundabout, you've seen some clearing taking place to give us a better scope of the landscape. The intention is to put a bus terminus there. It's a mini terminal, so to speak, that would service what I call the northeastern corridor of the country. In Grosley, you have none of that. You don't have any facility to provide that kind of service. And therefore, Grosley is certainly going to be one other area. We need to find a location to put that sort of terminus or terminal, whichever um, term you want to utilize, so as to facilitate the, um, the, traf the, the road traffic users. Um, I have personally spent some time looking at the situation in Grosley. For example, on the morning in Grosley, it's chaos. Can't get a bus, the frequency of buses moving in and out of Grosley or moving up and down the Cassius Grosley Highway seem to be a rare thing. And so we will be looking at those situations. That would also mean that the Department of Transport would also have to look at the frequency of the services being provided. Many of those, um, um, what you call the minibus associations, have what is called a rotation system, which suits them but does not suit the general public. What we want to know is to have a public transportation system that is scheduled, that is frequent, and that is reliable. Unless we have that sort of system in the country, then the, the economic activity in the country will grind to a halt at a particular time. In some, in some parts of the country, it grinds to a halt at 4 o'clock, others, others at 6, 
and others you just wouldn't get a bus after seven. And what you really need to do is to get, have activity within the economy so that if you're living at Debara in Babono and you do have a scheduled transportation system, you know you can leave your home at 8 in the night and get back by 12 if that service ends at 12. So this is the vision we're looking at. This is a vision which will be also enshrined when we launch our year, our program infrastructure 2030. Good morning. Um, on the, the infrastructure, the ministry's uh, plan, infrastructure 2030, uh, with your responsibility for WASCO, the water and sewage company, they're announcing um, a sort of reduction in the water supply. Mm -hmm. Do you think it is time for St. Lucia to consider uh, desalinating water to really fill in the gaps mm -hmm. when, when, when that arises? Yeah. Very good question. In fact, the concept of infrastructure 2030 is really one, is a concept which more or less attempts to get the country to erase the deficit in infrastructure. And what I mean by the deficit, our infrastructure is behind. It's some, in some instances, archaic. With WASCO, some of the water lines have been under the ground there for many, many years. And ever so often, you would find that once we repair a road, a few weeks later, in, WASCO is digging up the road, and then we have to get in and to repair it. Now, that is because the infrastructure, the water infrastructure is very bad. So infrastructure 2030 is to do a number of things. One, to begin to look at the infrastructure, whether it's roads, bridges, etc., whether it's public utilities, electricity, and WASCO, communications, energy, you just name it, anything that needs infrastructure, okay? WASCO has been called upon to begin to think of its strategic plan. The strategic plan would deal with what is happening now, what should take place between now and 2030. So by 2030, we'd be at the threshold of development, meaning that we'd have erased all, those def all the deficit and to be ready to continue development in a strategic manner rather than to allow development to fall back. So for example, as part of the year of infrastructure, one of the roads that will be done very soon is the Chaussee Road. Along Chaussee Road over the last few years, we've had major breaks, major leaks in the water line. So we are saying before we go into the construct, reconstruction of Chelsea Road, WASCO must tell us what are the issues there and we should put in new pipelines. So this morning as I speak, the Ministry of the Department of Infrastructure is meeting with WASCO to do the necessary assessments and to look at whatever plans that they have in place for the replacement of the six inch line or whatever size pipe they have down there to ensure that once we touch that road, they will go in and put in the new lines. Once we cover it, it should not be. It should not be interfered with. The other thing we're looking at is to begin <coughs> to set the, set the standards for the location of pipelines. Should pipelines be placed in the middle of the road? I do not believe. It should continue. We should put pipelines on the side of the road and connect it with sleeves so that those on either sides of the road can connect the water. So your question, yes, it is time that WASCO begin to look at those things. And part of it is to be able to assess our current water production, first capacity um, production, and then to see whether there's need to bring in any additional source of water generation, be it um, desalination or other ways of harvesting water. But we must look at it. Because if we are serious about the development of the country, where we are going, I mean, we are speaking of new hotels coming into the country. You have hotels in the south coming up. You have hotels in the north. There's a developer at Mont Pima, as we speak, building a new hotel, um, a wellness center, and family hotel. It means we need water. Now, physical development, planning, ought to also have in its, in, in its plans, as part of Infrastructure 2030, some new policies to determine and to more or less determine what is required if you're coming to build a hotel on the beach. <clears throat> if you're building a hotel on the beach, the advice may be to put in your own desalination plant. So a lot of these things are all part of what we are talking about 
as we speak of infrastructure 2030. But for the immediate, what we call year of infrastructure 2024, any road that has been built, it is our belief that we need to engage Wasco and to get Wasco to put those lines beneath the road. New lines and preferably on the side of the road. Okay. So under, under your portfolio for transport, um, we would have heard from the National Association of Driving Schools that they were displeased with the removal of the oral um, assistance for the practical, not the practical, the theory exam. Um, they would have sent a letter over to the Ministry of Transport um, hoping to get a sit down to discuss a way forward. Does the ministry currently stand behind its decision to completely remove it or are there any plans to introduce yes, something we, else? Yes, we stand behind the decision and um, the method of what is called an oral exam is really not an oral exam, it's an oral discussion. And so if we're doing an oral exam, let us do an oral exam. If you come in to, um, into the ministry to do an exam and we want to test you orally, then we must test you orally. It's not supposed to be a conversation in which there is a discussion. They have written, they have not given much detail as to what their concerns are, but I'm hoping that very soon we will meet with them to hear their claim and to address the situation. Okay, thank you. Uh, so there are concerns about <coughs> the Ministry of Infrastructure's implementation rate. So a project would be um, written down and by the time it starts there are many years. What, what would you say are the reasons why the rate of implementation is so long and how can you how can the ministry well, shorten it? Well I would love it? to see whoever is making those claims I would like to see the documentation in terms of how are we able to make an assessment of the rate of implementation I mean, what measurements are you using? How are you assessing implementation? Are you just sitting back and saying, well, implementation is taking too long? Implementation generally has a, a timeline. So, for example, if we're building this building here, it doesn't start the day we, you start construction. It starts on the day the concept is arrived at, the designs, the feasibility studies, designs, reviews, approval, DCA approval, approval, etc., and moving forward, and then implementation. And anything can cause delays. So I would love to see that document, if there is such a document, to understand it, then I'll be able to answer a question even more accurately. Do we know what the average implementation rate is for the ministry? The ministry? Our, in terms of implementation, almost every project that we highlight annually is implemented. Okay. If you want to speak about the speed of implementation, it may be, you know, it may stagger a bit. But in terms of implementation, every year, based on our budget, our projects are implemented within the 12-month period. Those projects that are to be implemented, implemented over a longer period, there can be delays. For example, there are some projects we do not have total control of. So you take the Millennium Highway, for example. That project is a project which was funded for grant funding from the British government. The British government decided that the funds will be channeled through the CDB. The conditions under which the project was to be implemented, there are certain uh, guidelines. So you have the CDB providing oversight. It, it requested a project coordinating office. It re requested a project consultant who more or less is the one who looks, keep an, keeps an eye on the project. The ministry is the client, so they are providing the service to us. So we have no direct um, control of saying, we need this thing done today, these are the conditions. In fact, what has happened on the Millennium Highway in a number of instances is that the consultant didn't, um, was not satisfied with the quality of material being used on the project. To the extent that prior to two months ago, the, the, all of the materials and the material mix designs were rejected by the consultant. The contractor had to go to Barbados and Martinique to get limestone and other stones out of Martinique because the consultant said the material being offered by the contractor here in St. Lucia was unacceptable. 
So these have delayed the project. Okay? So there are a number of factors which contribute towards delays of projects. But I, as far as the ministry is concerned, we have been able to implement all of our projects. I have two follow-up questions. Mm -hmm. As we on the roads, I just want to stick there. Mm -hmm. uh, you had promised, maybe like about a year and a half ago or two, um, for the Grosley, uh Rodney Bay Road project, mm -hmm. that of perhaps a sort of forensic report. Mm -hmm. Was that ever handed to you? Was, was an investigation? The report, the report was done. The number of deficiencies which were found, or if I should say, which were highlighted in the report, and um, there, there certainly there are recommendations as to how we proceed with the project, okay? Uh, as it is now, the government has commenced and we more or less have concluded negotiations with the Kuwait, the Kuwaiti Fund. And they have agreed to do the section of road between Shock and Maricel. The balance of the road from Maricel to Grosley Junction will be done through funding from the CDB and we're in the process of finalizing that itself. What the CDB is doing is reviewing designs which were done prior to the construction of the segment of road at Rodney Bay for which there were no designs. Okay, so we're looking at the these previous designs and then to move forward with construction using CDB funding. You said there were no designs, but you're looking at the previous designs? There were no Did designs I? at the... They didn't... Well, let me just phrase this better. At the time the current Rodney Bay project was being done, it wasn't designed... It wasn't being done based on the design previously. Okay? It was being done based on drawings which were done at the time of construction. Okay? Those were not approved designs. Uh, sorry, can you give us the time period? Maybe it will help us. The time period of what? Can you give us the time period as to when the construction started, the designs? You said they were being done with drawings at the construction period. The, the actual designs, approved designs, were done in 2015-2016. Okay, 2015-2016, the designs were done. The work which was being done in 2020-21 were works done outside of that approved design. So they were just being done based on a concept. Okay? What Second, were the other deficiencies? What were the... What were... Because you said... Also, I take it that lack of design mm -hmm. would have been a deficiency in That's that project. One, yes. What were the that other the deficiencies? Deficiency. That was the main deficiency. There are others that, you know, will, would, would add up. But the main deficiency was lack of designs. Uh, and so the contractor who was on that uh, mm -hmm. project, uh, what is happening with that contractor? Uh, the legal the issues, has, settlements, the, the can you explain to us? The government has obligations, and those obligations will be settled based on law. Okay? Mm -hmm. Is it currently being discussed, or are you... Those discussions have been going on. I'm not part of the discussions. My, my job is to do what is at hand. The issues, the legal issues, all of those other issues have been dealt with by the legal um, authorities. But nothing corrupt was, was found? I never, said, I never said so. It was a question. I didn't say you said so. Okay. I just asked if no, any, I never said so. anything corrupt was found. I never said so. <clears throat> uh, just my final question. I know there were ABNCs in there. I'm so sorry. But the final question, Mr. Minister... Uh, to do with the uh, John Compton Dam, mm -hmm. considering and uh, what we were discussing earlier with, with the sort of um, mm -hmm. drying up of our yeah. reservoirs. The desilting, uh, can you bring us up to speed as to what's happening there and what more does Wasco need in order for that to be completed? Well, there's a lot to be done. The phase of the silting which was done under the previous administration for which I had no responsibility or part of. I wasn't the Minister for Utilities. Uh, some $60 million was spent. Uh, some, it's an, 
the figure of the silting was something between 10 and 20 percent, the silting that took place. So it means there's still a lot more desilting to be done. Um, now we have spent $60 million to desil 20% of silt. There's still 80% and building backup that has to be desilted. And therefore, part of Wasco's um, um, strategic plan has to take into consideration some of those matters. Matters of how do we continue to maintain the, um, the John Compton Dam in as far as making it a a viable resource through the silting, and what other m methods or mechanisms can be put in place in terms of being able to to augment our water supply, particularly in the north. Okay, your final so, question. I, I, yes, sir. Just, just <laughs> please bear with me. Just two more. Uh, with regard to Wasco, though you mentioned that we have to look new ways at laying the pipes, uh, and you want it now to be uh, either alongside. Uh, roadways or beneath? Parallel or beneath. Parallel. Parallel. With, in other words, to, to ensure that once those pipes are laid down, there's minimal inter um, disruption upon whenever there's a break. What is the sort of budgetary support WASCO is being given? Because they would need to now get more sturdy, if you will. I, I suppose I, I'm not one versed in this, but mm -hmm. I'm thinking that they would need to perhaps upgrade the type of pipeline that they will be using. Certainly, they would need to upgrade, and then when we get to that point, we'll deal with it, because they've got to do a feasibility study, and of course, to be able to indicate to government what resources they, are, they will be in need of. But remember, WASCO is a, a, a public corporation. It's a public corporation. They don't, they don't operate on any government subvention or subsidy. It's a public corporation. They operate as a business. And therefore, what government can do as a fully government-owned or corporation is to give guarantees to loans and other forms of financing. And so any more thoughts, um, and any more thoughts on being able to approve or set an increase for WASCO? That is not a matter on the table, I must admit. It is not a subject on the table. WASCO has the... the um, latitude at any given time to seek an increase in, in um, rates any time they so desire. And that re request is made to the National Utility Regulatory Commission. Yeah, thank you, sir. Now my final okay. question. I do appreciate your patience. Thank Done. you so much, Madam Press Secretary. Uh, th thank you. For correct. That, that is so correct. We did hear from the uh, uh, police, I think more specifically the traffic department, about a uh, sort of, um, I don't want to use the word ring, but they did, advise, they did advise the public mm -hmm. about a f um, false uh, driver's license mm -hmm. scheme that was happening. What, what is the, from your ministry's uh, standpoint, have you conducted an internal investigation? What is the sort of assistance you're providing well, the to the police, authorities? The police has been <clears throat> conducting investigations on false or fabricated driver's licenses for some time now. It's not anything new. It didn't happen last week. It didn't happen last month. It didn't happen the month before, neither last year. It is a matter which has been happening for some time now, and we're continuing. It's, it's a sustained investigation, trying to see whether we can zoom in on who has equipment on the island producing those licenses. And that we will continue until we're able to find out where is it coming from. Um, yes, Mr. Minister, just, just quickly. Um, it's, a, it's a topic that we've, you know, we've had discussions on in the past. It, the public transportation, mm -hmm. the government will at any point step in to, to, to complement or to, or to or, or, you know to provide support to the transport especially now with the school the schools and mornings we see the, we, we see the chaos at the grocery bus stop I mean you just mentioned about yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. but will there be any time that the government would step in because people have spoke about bigger buses where that could take a 24 or 40 seat of people because there's more people up on this you sure you want me to tell you what I intend doing <laughs> no I just want anger the to bus drivers if <laughs> no, I tell you no 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 but I'm let just, just saying it's a serious would, would matter something it's, a serious, yes. it's a very serious matter and it's one which is presently under consideration in fact the CDB has conduct, conducted a study in Grenada and St. Lucia to look at our two countries' public transportation system 
and to be able to determine or to make a recommendation to the government, how do we proceed? Our public transportation system is certainly different to Barbados, different to a certain extent different to um, Grenada. Sure. Ours is one of public, so-called public service transportation system that is operated by the private sector. Uh, there is no doubt that we are not providing, through the current system, a reliable service, a reliable, dependable, um, scheduled service. What I mean by that is, if a worker is le leaving Castries to head to Grosley, that worker ought to know at what time the buses are moving. Is it 6 o'clock? Is it 7 o'clock? Do I get there at 7 and get a bus? And these are problems that affect us. So we believe that once the study is, the report is given to the government of St. Lucia, we can then have some level of public consultation not only with the, mini, the bus drivers, but also with the private sector, with the consumers, etc., etc., so that they can at least study the recommendations that are being made and to look at, and so that government can make a determination on the way forward. Whatever the report um, uh, recommends, we will certainly meet with the general public. I believe personally that, the, that's my opinion, I believe personally that we need to dissect the transportation, public transportation system. I think we need to put on the primary road network, larger buses, and if I follow my mind, buses operated by a, a wholly owned government service. That service will, will be one, grossly to Castries, Castries, West Coast, East Coast. The communities can then um, line, line in, connect into that primary road network service and provide to the small communities. But move more people on the primary road network. You can decongest the city. So whereas you may need, you, when you put in, a, say, a 60-seater, you know how many, how many buses you're pulling off the road? Four buses. Okay, but the four buses now would be able to operate at the community level. So these are some thoughts. These are not the decisions of government. That is only a thought as to how we can proceed to provide what I call mass transportation. Okay? The idea is to see how we can resolve the problems we have at this time in the country. Okay, choice will ask one question. Then the final question was the solution is solution you want. Okay, Minister, um, with the um, traffic management project that's going on, we see the construction of the mini roundabout by SNS. Um, when will the mini roundabout by Computer World be constructed? Because we see that though the, the, the mini roundabout by SNS has been constructed and help with the traffic flow, we still see congestion of traffic building up. Can you just tell us as to when that mini roundabout mm -hmm. there will be constructed? Yeah. So these are all soft measures, huh? The mini roundabout at SNS, the proposed mini roundabout by, by in computer world, these are all soft measures. Now, I do not believe we need to put six mini roundabouts all along the way. What we do need is a major roundabout somewhere in that vicinity where we believe that we have the most traffic. Okay? My philosophy is that the bridge between computer world and uh, the Bois Center should be condemned. I believe a new bridge should be established between the gas station and the commercial center, which lines up with Orange Grove Plaza. That is my belief. It would then regulate and control all of the traffic coming from the back road. Instead, they come off by computer world, you come off by the gas station and the plaza. So you'd regulate all the traffic at that junction. Okay? At the at SNS Plaza, I still believe that if we put another form of signaling, that it would help the traffic. Whether you want to keep the mini roundabout, because it appears that people are accustomed to it now. All those who said you couldn't go all around, it was not intended for you to do a 360 degree turn. What it was intended to do was to regulate the traffic and manage the traffic in and out of the SNS Plaza. And all it calls for is just a wider circle now, I think. We just need to put a wider circle, acquire some more land, and it would work perfectly for that location. But lower down, where you have a confluence of activities, the, the Orange Grove Plaza, the gas station, the Bois de Orange Plaza, I believe the best thing for there would be a major roundabout. 
Okay. Um, in response to the to the traffic situation on the Cassius Grizzly Highway, mm. a lot um, you're finding now uh, people people in general are saying that there should be a, a ferry service um, between Cassius and Grizzly. Uh, what do you? How um, impactful do you think that would be in terms of well, regulating anything, traffic? Anything, anything that can reduce the volume of traffic on the Cassius Grizzly Highway will be welcomed. I'm not too sure how many people can take a boat ride from Grosley to the city. Some may, some may not. Um, but for sure, it is a good idea. It is a good idea where you can take a, a boat ride from the marina and land at Point Seraphine or land right here at the, um, at the waterfront. Okay, it is a good idea. So how much time it will take? Probably a 20 minute um, ride. That might, might get you down. But otherwise, you also have to think of, can we do a park and ride service where you can park in a particular location? And maybe the private sector should look at it. You have a large parking area, a large parking lot, where persons can come in and park in that parking lot, and you get a specialized bus that will take you to the city, maybe a 60-seater bus, or maybe a, 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 a 30 or 40-seater bus, take you to the city, and um, to your workplace. And then you have scheduled times of returning. You have scheduled both in both directions. You have scheduled times. So a lot, there are a lot of ideas that we can put in to help alleviate the traffic along the Castries Grosley Highway. We do not need all those vehicles going into the city and congesting the city and stifling the city. What we need to do is to see what are the... There are some people who come to the city and they park and they, they park until they're ready to leave. So does it matter where you park? You park at the park and ride location, you get a comfortable air-conditioned bus that will take you down to your workplace, and on evenings, you know the time the bus is leaving, so you just get to the bus and get back to your car. Your car is safe, and you know you've saved some fuel. Lisa, you have a last question? <laughs> Next time. Next time. Next time. I promise you, you'll love it.